Welcome to Make Up Your Life with me, your host, Devon Testagrosa. We have the amazing Carrie Blair with us today. Welcome, Carrie. Hi, thank you for having me. Yes, it is our pleasure, and we are so honored to hear all about how Carrie Blair became Carrie Blair. So this is exciting, and, and I, I can't wait for the listeners to listen or to hear you talk about um, your career and how it grew. I know you're with MAC Cosmetics, but in a different capacity than we've ever had before as far as our guests go. So I'm super excited to explore that. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so you're currently in New York, right? That's correct. I actually live right outside of the city in uh, New Jersey in a little area called Union City, which is right outside the Lincoln Tunnel, which you guys know the geography of New York. But I've been, my goodness, I've been here I was here in 2003 and 2004, and then, as I was just telling you, I moved to Chicago for three and a half years, and then I moved back here in 2008, and I've been here since. Yeah. Um, I think I know where you're talking about. It's been so many years since I've gone through that tunnel, um, but I want to say, didn't they have, who's the guy that bakes, uh, oh gosh, there was a bakery there that that everybody was excited to go to, I thought, right outside, if you take the tram or the train. Anyway, doesn't matter. I'm going in a rabbit hole. But it's okay. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to hear you're outside of the city because it's a little wild there, uh, I think, right? Um, yeah. But you, so you started in Maryland, right? Is I where did. You grew up in D.C. Yeah. And um, you went kind of everywhere. You're you've been in print, you've been in uh, a couple different areas, but I know beauty makeup and conceptual makeup, is that your specialty? If we, if we have a specialty? Yeah, I would say that beauty and fashion is probably where I would say I, I live. That's sort of my sweet spot. Um, I have, just so you know, I've worked for Mac for 25 years. So the duration of my career has been with Mac and, uh, so I've worked in a lot of different capacities, doing a lot of different things for the brand. Um, yeah, I didn't realize it was um, 25 years. I thought maybe you had worked for them. And then I know you did a lot of runway shows and editorial shoots and celebrity things. So I wasn't sure if you left Mac and then you came back or you were doing that simultaneously. Yeah, simultaneously. Uh, so I have a very unique position with the brand. Uh, and so I'm happy to talk about that and, and kind of what that looks like. And of course, I mean, obviously being in a beauty school and obviously just working in the whole concept of not, I'm sorry, makeup school. Cause I know you teach special effects and all different kinds of things there. Um, it's it, the landscape has changed tremendously. Uh, and I've, I've seen a lot working. So there's a lot of different aspects. I think, you know, obviously retail beauty and then, and then editorial and then fashion. And there's just so many different things and caveats that have changed, especially with social media. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I had said to another guest that worked for Mac, I remember Mac from the early 90s, which is uh, when I think you got started. It was like a thing to try and get into Mac. It was like amazing. They would send you to Toronto for a few weeks and you get yep. this awesome training. And, and it really was a catalyst to launch your career. So, um, but that was a very long time ago. I think since then, Mac has changed tremendously as far as... Um, maybe how, how they hire or what they hire for. But I remember it being, that was the only, that was the only brand I wanted to work for. <laughs> did you ever work for us? I never did. Okay. Well, I, I, uh, I did have, when I, when I went to Chicago, I actually worked in the capacity of the director of training for the Midwest. And so I had 12 states all surrounding Illinois and Michigan was one of them. So I was in, in Detroit and all the surrounding areas. I've been everywhere in the mitten. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, it, it's, um, I probably would have crossed paths with you is what I was trying to say, but you know, it, I, I've been very fortunate in the sense that I have met so many amazing people and also helped to launch a lot of really amazing careers. Um, and so to be kind of, uh, an integral part of the education of some of these makeup artists that I truly respect and have gone on to do so many amazing things that I'm still have relationships with is, is pretty amazing and, and really rewarding. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's definitely been a really great balance with Mac as far as retail, but then also still 
uh, being allowed to get your own um, jobs and, and, you know, really express your, uh, your artistry. Because I, I think the fear, and this would definitely, if I could speak for the listeners, they would say, you know, sure. their fear with retail is getting stuck in retail. Yeah. And um, I, I definitely know that that has happened a little bit more with Mac um, versus what, maybe what was happening, or, or you can shed light on that. But we we've, we've have a pretty close relationship um, with a local mall where there is a freestanding Mac store and there's a Sephora. And, and it's really um, about the sales and less about artistry, which of course, right? I mean, you, you have to, you can't just do fun makeup all day. You have to sell product. Um, but it's, it's less of a focus. It seems just in general, whether it was Mac or somebody else, there's less focus on the education. Um, and that's just feedback from our students. So would you think that's true in, in all your years that it's kind of dwindled down to what it was? I mean, I came to Mac, I went, I started a Mac in 1996 and I bought my first lipstick in 1993 and, and I wore from 93 to 96, I was definitely a Mac user and a Mac advocate. And I was very intrigued by the brand. Yeah. Um, And I went to Mac because, and I I went in search of employment at Mac because of the education Yes. Um, and, and, you know, the kind of education, the amount of time that you were educated, the continual support of education. And then I ended up in education for the brand for many years. Um, and so, yes, has there been a shift in how much education is available to our artists now than there was even 10 years ago? Of course, um, a lot of that has to do with honestly, how people learn. Um, and, you know, the idea of things being a little bit more digestible and a little bit more bite-sized, I feel like even myself, as someone who's almost 50, um, that my my attention span, <laughs> thank you to Instagram, has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I certainly, I can understand where people have the perspective that, you know, it is a very, it can be very sales driven because at the end of the day, to your point, it is a business. Um, When we started off as a, as a very small kind of tiny little brand, when you look at tiny brands now that are able to pivot a little quicker or do a a little bit of different things than something that is as large and and global as Mac is, um, it does, it does have to shift a bit because, there are so many other things that factor into how we support our artists. But yes, I mean, with, with COVID and also with um, just the evolution of business, it has changed a bit um, as far as how education is, is uh, in, infused into their everyday lives. Yeah, well, I and I think, I, I think there's a lot more savvy artists too. Yeah, I mean, for, um, for sure. we, I know as far as, you know, the school 11 years ago, we did not have such talent like we do now. I mean, it's amazing. So I, I just think that's the resources having, you know, an, the online platform, whether it's Instagram or YouTube or wherever, you know, people draw uh, inspiration or or find learning tools that I think really has made an impact. I, I would totally agree with you. And it's also for an artist like myself who has worked in the fashion industry for 20 years. I have been backstage since... My first season was, uh, gosh, March of 2000, or Feb- excuse, excuse me, February of 2001. Um, you know, it's sometimes it's very interesting to see artists that are just either started off as a makeup enthusiast or as an influencer and are now deemed a makeup artist. But the difference is, and what I think is really interesting is being able to do makeup on yourself versus being able to do makeup on a multitude of skin tones and age groups and conceptual types of makeup on other people is a different skill set. And so I think that's the other thing that has happened too, is that the education of being kind of your own little celebrity which I'm, I, of course, through this pandemic especially, have been working so hard to do because I only have my face to work on. I don't have children. <laughs> I've been by myself. And so you do have to kind of re-examine your face and be like, okay, how can I take my face and make it look interesting to everybody else as opposed to just using my craft as a way to express myself creatively? Does that make sense? Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. I, evolution, like everything else, right? It, this is... Um, this is where we are in the industry. Um, let me circle back to 
your career. Okay. That's why we're here, right? I mean, yeah. I think could talk about the evolution um, being that we're very similar in <laughs> age. And also we've seen so many things, so many changes. <clears throat> so that will have to be for another show. But I would love to um, hear what, how your career with Mac went, because we still encourage our students after graduation or even newer artists to to align themselves with a retail brand and get the experience um, mm -hmm. as far as, you know, whether you're freelancing or you, you have to know how to, and I hate to say sell, but you have to sell yourself, right? You have to make what you're offering attractive. And I think that retail is a really great way to assist students with this. So tell me, um, did you start you, I know you were in, you were in education, you mentioned, but did you start just in retail? Like just, I did. Okay. I did. Uh, so it's a, I totally agree with you because people ask me all the time. I get questions, whether it's from our staff or whether it's from, you know, people's daughters or sons or whoever always asking me like, how do you get started? And should I work in retail? And what do you think? How do you become a makeup artist? You become a makeup artist by doing, honestly. Um, yeah. I think that's how you become anything that's a craft or that is, has any kind of skill involved, um, unless you're somehow a prodigy. But uh, I, I digress in the sense that I started at, at uh, Nordstrom, actually, at a ta Towson Town Center in Baltimore, Maryland. And I started as a Mac artist at 40 hours a week. And it was interesting because at that time, I had gone to college. I was super into doing makeup and hair in high school. I did everyone's makeup for prom and homecoming and, you know, strapped them to my toilet as my makeup chair and, you know, was doing all kinds of different things on them, whether mm -hmm. they liked it or not. And I did my <laughs> I did my first freelance wedding when I was a senior in high school. One of my parents' friends was getting married and I did her makeup. And and then I went to college not for makeup. <laughs> I went to college, regular, uh, uh, we got my bachelor's in uh, communications and I really wanted to be a VJ and that didn't work out. And I ended up working in film and video production for a few years. And I worked on a movie and I met a makeup artist and I completely was enamored with him. And I was like, this is what I've always wanted to do. And I didn't know how to do it, you know? And so I started kind of sniffing around and I thought, well, maybe I have to go to work. And I didn't really want to work retail, but I I didn't really know what the other options were. So yeah. I went to Mac and I interviewed and um, I took a while, but I did, it took about, I only did one interview, but it took a while for them to be, have a space to hire me. Cause at that time there was only full time. There was no part-time happening. And so I also enrolled in school for aesthetics. So at the same time, my first year at Mac, I was going to school part-time for, to get my uh, aesthetic license as well as working at the, at the brand. And so, um, yeah. Why, why did. did you think you needed your aesthetics just to have more information on skincare? Yeah, or? I think I was, I think I was, I, I, I think I wanted the job so badly. I wanted it so bad that I was like, maybe if I go to school, they'll, it'll be more of a chance of them hiring me. I don't know. I, I just felt like it was important to, to me, knowledge is power, education. Like the more, you know, the farther you'll go. I mean, as sure. cliche as that might sound. So I, I really just had I just wanted to know everything I could know. I was very hungry. I was very young and excited and interested and always kind of, I always sort of walked left of center. I always sort of was, at, you know, work, walked to the beat of my own drum. And I felt like Mac just, there was an allure there to me. It was almost like a siren's call. You know, I was like, I have to work there and I'll do anything that I need to do to get there. Yeah. And so I started school and literally the next week they called and offered me the job. <laughs> So I think there's something about momentum. I think there's something that like busyness, you know, uh, creates busyness. I don't, I don't know how else to explain that, but like it just sort of all kind of fell into place. And I think it was because it was supposed to happen. And I truly believe that whatever you nurture in your life, whatever you pay attention to in your life will become successful for you because that's how everything works. You know, if you want your relationship to work, you spend time on it. If you want your career to blossom, you, you hustle, you spend time, you develop skills, you research, you buy product, you talk to people, you network. And so, I mean, not to get too off of my, my career path, but I, I, that has been my experience anyway, as, as what I've learned or gleaned over the past 25 years being in this industry. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it was interesting timing as well, because I'd been at the brand for a little over a year and Mac sort of restructured how they handled their education. 
and they wanted to make it more locally kind of homegrown and they wanted it to be have our artists have more of a relationship with their educators uh, locally. And so I interviewed as well as 45 other people in our region, because at that time, I, I hate to be uh, harsh, but I feel like someone had to die for you to get a job at the brand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it was crazy. It was a phenomenon. There was just, it was always busy and always slammed and there was always a line. And, and so I, I um, I interviewed and I got the job and I truly believe that having the aesthetics background gave me a little bit of a leg up because there were people who had been at the brand for years and years and years at that point that did not get the job. And I had been there barely a year and I was promoted. And so it was pretty special. And, you know, I did, I did that in DC, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina and Philadelphia. The region was very big doing basic trainings, which was like their initial, you know, introduction to Mac, as well as, um, yearly or sorry quarterly uh update trainings where we would you know bring the staff in and teach them about new products and about customer service and about whatever the various initiatives were at the brand and i'll say this about retail for any of your listeners that are or in your students that are nervous the thing that's so wonderful about working at a counter especially a busy counter or our store is that you have the ability and the opportunity to touch every different kind of skin skin tone, skin texture, age group, demographic, and you learn how to connect with people because I'm sure you would agree with me, Yvonne, that like, it's really about connection. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's almost something you just can't teach. Like we can, we let our students know we have a whole business sector, letting them know that, that clients don't get dropped off on a bus once you're done. Um, <laughs> and and um, it, it's the same with etiquette. It's the same with customer um, interactions, customer relationships, customer service. I agree 100%. There are so many, I I worked at Sephora, so I didn't work for Mac, but I did work Uh for Sephora. And oh my, it was just an awesome experience. There's so many things that pop out that were disastrous um, when I was a young artist. I don't know that the client ever knew, but yeah, I mean, I you're still just, thinking about it, right? All I'm years still later. <laughs> thinking about it. I am still thinking about it. I, I will never forget. I have to share this because maybe our listeners will think it's funny. Um, I had, there was a gentleman that came in and he wanted foundation on. And he had stubble, right? Naturally, because um, he was a man. And, um, and, and, and grew it that way anyways, it wasn't clean shaven. So anyhow, I tried to remove whatever foundation he had tried on because it wasn't matching with a cotton round. Oh my. Mm-hmm. I already know where this is going. Yes. So by the time <laughs> I was done and of course to have such a contrast, he had brown skin and there's a white cotton round. It, I mean, just imagine, right? Oh my, yes, I've been there. And, and so. not always that maybe it would have looked better if he had lighter skin. It just, because there was such a contrast, I was like, okay, there's not even any hiding this. And now I'm trying to pick off the cotton round off his stubble. Right. I can't get it off. He looks like Santa Claus and I'm mortified. And, um, and I don't want him to be mortified. I don't want him to be embarrassed. So I, I will never, ever forget that. And um, lesson learned, you know, right? I'll never uh, use a cat and run. And I, I surely would have used a four by four gauze that I had available. Right. Um, but it didn't occur to me. So anyhow, yes, I can't, I can't say that, you know, retail just does so much for your career in so many different aspects. So, but I'm interested in knowing, so you, you, you got out from behind the counter and you were educating and then where, cause now we'd like you're at some point, uh, and I don't know what the pivotal, you know, change was, but then you're doing runway and you're doing celebrities and you're, yeah, yeah. Where, how did, how did we go from retail well, to that? It's, it's interesting because um, I went from, the counter, then to education. I then moved to Atlanta uh, with the brand and was training and building that region. I mean, we were, it was on fire in the late, uh, late 90s, early 2000s. If you remember, Mac was exploding and I was part of that explosion. I, 
when I got to Atlanta, there was four stores. And when I left, just in Georgia alone, there were 12. Never mind Alabama, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Northern Florida, Southern Virginia, <laughs> you know, Mississippi. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was Tennessee. I was in all the, I, I built, I helped to build this brand. I mean, it, it's crazy. So there was a position in 1998 when I moved to it, to Atlanta called the senior, senior artist. And it, it seemed at that time that these were like hand selected people, you know, and you had to have some special something to get this position. And at that time for me, education was really where my heart was. And so I wasn't too ruffled about it. But as I started, this job started to unfold, I was like, that's where I should be. I want to be an ambassador to this brand. And in order to make us have street credibility, they had to give us opportunities sort of behind the scenes to give us like the senior title, right? Like what, what makes right. you senior? So Mac had an, a tremendous uh, relationship way back with Frank and Frank in Canada with fashion. Um, and also too, at that point, John Dempsey had come in. Um, and for those of you who don't know John Dempsey, he is the global brand president of Estee Lauder. But at that time he had come in as the brand president of Mac. And his, today is his 30th anniversary with the with the Estee Lauder companies, which is why I'm bringing that up. That's neither here nor there. Oh, but, that's a neat, fun fact. Yes, but he was very interested in developing fashion for the brand and what Mac stood for and the trends and all of those things. And so we had this incredible sort of networking that was happening with all of these smaller and some larger designers internationally, whether it was Milan, Paris, London, New York. And we also wanted to keep our roots where the roots started, which was with professional makeup artists. And so there was this incredible network that we had with you know, people like Sharon Dowsett, Tom Pichot, James Killardos, um, Val Garland, at that point, at that time, Mary Greenwell. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on and on, but there was a ton, Diane Kendall, all of these, Charlotte Tilbury, I mean, I could keep listing names, but they, these artists were sort of the, the idea of makeup artistry and working backstage because, it, you know, for a long time, if you watch the Kevin O'Quan documentary, you know, the models did a lot of their own makeup. But suddenly artistry and having a key or a head makeup artist that designed the look and had a team of people to come and execute became this sort of regular thing that happened in fashion. And so we were the team that supported these makeup artists. And that was how we got backstage. And what was so unique and so beautiful about what Mac did was we knew how to work as a team. So and we knew how the products worked and we knew how they worked together. And so we would go to the test with the key makeup artist and the stylist and the hair person and whoever else and show them what we had. We would help them figure out the colors. We would help them decide, you know, not that we weren't choosing the look necessarily, but we were helping them say, oh, you want a black pencil? Well, here's three that we have. What kind of finish do you want? Because this one's going to give you a matte finish and this one's going to be easy to blend and this one's going to be easy to smudge. And so we were the kind of the, the, the caveat or the, the, uh, the link between the brand and this artist and the product and this artist. And so that was really how we built our credibility as a team. And it's amazing how many top makeup artists wanted to work with us. I think obviously Mac was probably very generous in how they, you know, compensated these artists, but also giving them a team and giving them a product of people that knew how to do makeup and knew how the products worked made it so much easier for them. Um, yeah. and, and, and so it just sort of snowballed through that. I mean, in 2012, I actually got my nail license and started to do, Mac had a ton of nail polish and we were looking at a different way to connect backstage. And so I went to nail school because I was a nail art freak and I you know, was very interested in it. And so I started leading nail teams backstage, which was a trial by fire, but I did it. And um, that's how that happened. So the other thing that we would sort of dive in and out of, and of course the landscape, as I said earlier, has changed a lot, but we did a lot of, um, uh, sorry, like Tribeca Film Festival or Sundance. And there was a lot of celebrities there and they would come in and our PR would have relationships with their PR and we offered them services. And so essentially Mac was paying me to be there so that we could offer services to these stars or artists that needed makeup for their premiere or for their red carpet or for their panel discussion or whatever it was. And so that's how we built our CVs essentially. Um, and then obviously on the off season, if a designer needed 
a lookbook shoot or they needed somebody to come in and help them with the models for uh, appointments with press. If we did the show, we knew what the makeup was for the show and we would come in and we would help them or, you know, and so this, this relationship kind of evolved in many different ways. And we also really love to support small brands. And so oftentimes with a smaller brand, the budget might not be there in the same way, but we certainly had artists that knew how to lead a show. Yeah, that's amazing. So, I mean, in all honesty, do you think that you would have experienced half of that if you weren't with Mac? I do not. Right. I, I mean, know. and I think I think listeners need to realize that that you know there and and I know things have changed and and we don't we're still uncertain with COVID, but at the end of the day, you're a brand. You know, an individual artist is a brand new brand, right? Nobody knows who you are. Nobody knows your work. Right. You you take on the identity of a brand when you connect with them and and it and it just fast forwards your career like by tenfold. So yeah. um you know whether it was back in the 90s or now I I still hold to hold by what I say as far as everyone needs to go through retail. You know, and, and I just want to take a second and talk about this because I, I, I can't ex- express this enough. You know, we used to teach when I first moved to Atlanta, we we kind of revamped our customer service and we were teaching this amazing structure called iMac. And it was like an interactive way that you worked with your customer, because for a long time when I started, you know, you did an appointment with the customer was an hour and a half long and we told them not to buy anything. I, mean, I know it was it wild. Was crazy. I mean, it was like, what's happening? Like, we'd be like, go home, look at it in a different light, show your significant other, come back. We'll be here. Here's a sample, you know, whatever. And, and then it was like, oh my God, this, this model's not really working anymore <laughs> because life is changing even then. And we got to figure out how to connect with our customers better. And here's what I'll tell you. Did I want to stand in front of a group of people that did not know me and meeting me for the first time as a trainer at Mac in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm standing there like, let me talk to you about how to interact with your customer and let's talk about opening lines and let's talk about defensive shields and, you know, all this different, whatever the heck it was. I still remember it like it was yesterday, but in the (laughs) emotional layer of the product and, you know, all these different things, but those are life skills. And let me tell you something, people want to act like all of that stuff that you learn in retail about customer service goes out the window when you become a a quote unquote freelance makeup artist or professional makeup artist or however you want to to make the moniker. And let me tell you something, it only heightens to the 10th degree because you have to know how to sell yourself. You know, have to know how to sell your makeup that you, when you go to a designer and a stylist and you show them a makeup you've designed, you better be ready to pitch that. Yeah, And you better be fun to hang out with and you better have a good personality and you better know savvy on the set because there are so many things that people expect you to know and working in New York, especially because it's, it's so interesting. Once in a while you have a micromanaging person on set, but most of the time they just trust you to do your job. And you got to know what, I mean, yeah, we all fake it till we make it. And every day is a school day. Trust me. I learn new stuff every single day, but you got to be able to like, pretend and tap dance your way through some things just like you were talking about with the beard and the cotton like you got to know how to fix that before the yes. gets upset either you got to have a sense of humor about it you got to come clean and learning those communication skills because communication to me you know is is not an it's not innate you learn that skill and so you have to practice it it's just like eyebrows on a face chart or eyebrows on a person for that matter um you have to practice those skills and if you want to get good at it you got to practice it. And so that to me is something I've stuck in my arsenal, you know, and I take with me everywhere I go. And I think that's the beautiful thing about working in retail, because it really does force you to be accountable to your image, to how you speak to people, to how you carry yourself, to how you interact and, and how you like are able to connect. I mean, one of the things that was so beautiful about my career is that I worked for RJ Reynolds tobacco company in NASCAR and like their creative services department before I came to work for Mac. So when I went to work in the South and this woman was standing there and I was doing her makeup and her husband was next to her, I could talk to him about NASCAR, you know? And so that gave me this really interesting edge to be able to speak to people and make them feel comfortable. 
And I think relatability is so important. And retail really gives you an opportunity to practice your trade while getting paid, while getting an education. I mean, there's so many benefits to it. And I don't know. I mean, I'm not. And stability. Stability, stability. and a, and a yeah. network. And this is the other thing, too. Yeah. When we talk about the beauty industry, whether whether it's in fashion and, and freelance or it's in retail, it is a small network of people. And it's amazing how many times you cross path with, paths with people again in the beauty industry. Yes. And so you really have to be careful. There's no bridge burning, you know, like you really oh, have yeah. to protect what you build. And so I, I think I can't stress that enough for up and coming makeup artists. I mean, honestly, like I want to inspire all of you to, to believe in, you know, what it is, set your goals for yourself, whether they're, you know, small micro goals or big, large, lofty goals, but set those things for yourself because you can achieve anything you want. And that's the beauty. I mean, I have been around the world. I have been to Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, Israel, Mexico, Milan, Paris, London, all of all over the United States, all over Canada. I have traveled the world with this brand. It's amazing. Like I have the chills. It's amazing. I mean, it is amazing. What? I have an amazing life. A, an amazing life and an inc incredible opportunity. I mean, but you know, in retrospect, though, too, you were so devoted to them. You knew that this is the brand you wanted to represent. I don't know if you knew it was going to be for this long, but <laughs> you knew that this is this was, you know, because sometimes I think it's um, we we enter a position because we think we should, you know, or, oh, this would be a good opportunity. You know, even the girls that have been with me since my inception at the school were because they really believed in my brand. They believed right. in the school. They believed in what we had to offer. And so I think it's no different with you, which is why you're still there, because you wholeheartedly believe in the brand and support the brand. I do. So, I, care, I care very much about it. Very much. I mean, yeah. and it's funny. Today, I just had my 25-year anniversary. Today is my parents' 54th wedding anniversary. Today's a big day. Um, yeah. And, and look at how lucky we are. And what did you yeah. say? It was Estee Lauder's what? John Dempsey's uh, 30th anniversary with Estee Lauder. Yes. Today, so. Like, whoa. He's, if you don't follow him on Instagram, you should. He's the best meme dealer around. Um, but I, I will say that I feel like when, when you th – th let me tell you something. This relationship – it's had its ups. It's had its downs. I've had my tears. I've had my emotional scar. You know, I mean, it has been a long-term relationship with everything that comes with that. You know, for anyone who's had a long-term relationship with anyone besides your parents, and even with your parents, you know, it comes with all the stuff. But I was in it to win it. And the best part about my experience at this brand has been the people. I don't care about, I mean, I love eyeshadow and lipstick and with gloss and I'm, you know, I'm a makeup junkie and glamour is my profession and all that stuff. But the people that I have connected with at this brand have made, I get to work with some of my best friends every single day on set. And do we pick on each other like sisters? 100%. But when we work together as a, as a machine of artists, like right now, my job, a lot of it consists of creating online assets for North America. So what that basically means is when you click on the Mac website, and you see like, let's say, I don't know, cherry lip liner, and you click on the pictures, you'll see three different skin tones with cherry lip liner, right? Well, we create those assets, my team and myself, that's what we do. That's what we've been working, working on for the past couple of years so that our website is accessible to people and it makes people say, oh, wait, that Studio Fix color looks great on this person. Well, we did that, but we created that image. So when we work together, we're pumping out, you know, 50 or 60 images on one day, oh all gosh. creating, all creating something different, all creating something that is either aspirational or attainable and, and saleable. And so we know how to do that together. And we have a heavy shot list. You know what? It, we work hard, but we get it done. And that to me, like, I have so much respect for the people that I work for and so much respect for the people that I've been able to touch, teach somebody something. That relationship, that energy that you create between you and your student, that's, that's what it's about. 
right? It's for the love of teaching, for the love of educating, for the love of seeing that person taking your idea and creating something really magical out of it. And that to me is what's been so special about my career. Um, I mean, yes, I've traveled a lot of places. I've gotten, had some incredible experiences. I mean, I'll just tell you this one story. I was testing for Oscar de la Renta um, many, many years ago. This is probably when I lived in, in New York the first time. And I was assisting our, uh, Rafael Pita, who was doing the makeup. And I think Orlando was doing the hair. And I'm standing in his studio watching him style models. Oscar himself. That's, incre that's incredible in itself. I don't know if all of our listeners will know who that is. Well, I get that. I He's hope a very they famous do. designer. I hope Look they him up. do. <laughs> Google, it's, a, it's your friend. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's, that, and, that, and again, there could be a whole nother podcast on just talking about references and knowing your references and how to build your references, because that's a whole nother aspect to make up artistry that you need to understand. Um, and I don't know how much you guys teach that in your, in, in your curriculum, but you know, understanding what the makeup looked like in the 1910s, 20s, oh, yeah. 30s, 40s. We have a whole through. piece and we introduce artists that they may not have seen because, right, let's be honest, these artists, and I'll, I'll get, give you back the mic in a second because I know no, you're going to tell me something amazing. But um, we have now put in our curriculum artists that are noteworthy. And even some that aren't uh, quite yet, like maybe in 10 more years, they'll reach the status of Kevin O'Quan or something like that, but we make sure to introduce them uh, to, and what, which is why we're doing this podcast, because there's so many great artists like yourself that might get overlooked because they don't have a reality TV show. Right. Um, right. <laughs> so yes, we do include that in our curriculum because there's so many important uh, and people that they need to know. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at somebody like Michael Anthony, for example, and if you guys don't know who he is, he does right now, he works pretty closely with Katy Perry. Um, but he worked at our Mac store in New York and he and I, you know, were friends and obviously, you know, he was an art Mac artist and he started his career with Roberta Flack. And again, you know, working on the road with her and she was an, an, a more mature R and B artist. If you don't know who she is, an incredible singer. And then he kind of left the brand with her and he had an experience to do Katie's makeup. He did Brooke Candy's makeup. Now he works with Ariana Grande. I mean, he's amazing. And everything he does is so interesting and so cool. And I'm so proud of him. I have a, my own little, uh, not really a podcast, but my own little series on Instagram called Behind the Brush. And he was one of my guests. And we had such a beautiful conversation just about gratitude and about experience and, and how you really, and taking care of yourself. I mean, it's so interesting um, to meet and, and to know these makeup artists from when they started. And I don't know if, if you know who Frankie Boyd is, but he is a, yeah. he's a, um, an artist here in New York. I, I met Frankie, he was in drag. He was a cashier at Macy's Lennox in Atlanta, Georgia, when I met him. And oh I, spent time, I spent time with him, like teaching him, we, we taught him how to do drag. We really taught him how to do drag. We taught him how to do a smoky eye. We taught him how, he moved to New York. He became a trainer and then he assisted Aaron DeMay for four years, who is a very famous makeup artist from um, New Zealand. If you don't know who he is, definitely check out his stuff. He was an ambassador for, Laura, uh, for Lancome for a long time. And then he, he got, he's with Streeters and he has uh, an incredible clientele and makes great money and has a great career. And he's one of my closest friends. And I'll tell you this, my proudest moment. I could not be more proud of him. Yeah, that's amazing. So I don't know. I mean, I, we're all kind of all over the place with this interview, but and I apologize for that. But I have a lot to say. I'm very passionate. <laughs> I, I'm, I need to hear about Oscar de la Rente. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I was nobody, you know, I was assisting Raphael. But the experience of standing in that designer's studio and watching him with Carolina Krakova, like the, putting on her dress and like, deciding, watching her walk through his, I mean, you're just sitting there like, I felt like dirty dancing, like I carried a watermelon, you know, like I, I was just like, yeah, am I, is this happening right now? You know, to sit in Carolina Herrera's amazing studio, you know, her, her offices and like, she's sitting on a couch talking with Diane Kendall, you know, and Orlando about what the look is. It's, she's, it's just, it's like, is this happening? Is it, am I really here? 
definitely a pivotal point in your career, yeah, I would I mean, imagine. It's just yeah, these moments, and, and, you, and I don't want to say I take them for granted. I do take them in stride because you can't sit there and be starstruck all the time. You have to be able to function. You have to be able to work. Right. I mean, I remember the first time I worked with Val Garland, I was like, I needed a diaper. Like, I was one of those moments where I was like, I might, like, have an accident here. I'm about to lose my mind. And <laughs> when you meet your makeup heroes and you – and there's certain things that they do that you, like, I always do that too, you know? And you have those moments. And then I ended up having a relationship with Val. And, like, she has a book uh, called, I think, Validated or something. It's over here somewhere. And she mentions me in her book. But there's just these moments where you're like, this is – this doesn't happen to everybody. Yes. You know, 100%. But it's amazing that one, thank you for sharing, because I think um, that all this is so wonderful for for our listeners to hear, you know, outside of even us both being advocates for work, working for, you know, to work for a brand, encouraging them, encouraging them to work for a brand. uh, I just love the stories because this is what is so amazing about being a makeup artist. You don't know where it's going to take you. There's so many different paths. And, and so many amazing opportunities. So I'm so thankful you're sharing all of this. So that definitely seemed like a, a huge pivotal moment. Who are some of your biggest influencers? I know you've named quite a few already, but who really um, is that person or was that person that, you know, made a difference in your life and that you maybe continue to follow or admire? Well, I would say my the first person, there's, there's been a couple inside people at Mac. Um, I think there's a woman, she does not work for the brand anymore. Her name was Michelle. Her, her name still is Michelle Ely. Uh, but she was the first person that did my makeup at Mac. And I remember being so entranced by her that not only did I want to her job, but I wanted to be like her. Like there was just something about her, her approach and the way that she spoke and the way that she looked. And I was like, I, I, I just need to be around you. And we ended up becoming very good friends. We're still good friends. Um, as well as my first trainer at Mac, Vanessa Smith, who does not again work for the brand anymore, but she was like a celebrity man. She would walk into Nordstrom and it was like paparazzi was kind of, I mean, it wasn't really happening, but it, it felt yeah. like she was, she had so much presence and she was so memorable, you know, and I think being memorable is really part of this, um, this job and not in an obnoxious way. You know, you don't want to be the makeup artist that lingers or the makeup artist that took too many pictures or the makeup artist they couldn't find on set or that was late. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Or the brushes were dirty. That's not the, the mark we want to leave here. Um, we want we want people to remember you because you were inspiring or because you did something breathtaking or you made everybody gasp. But I would say like right now, I mean, Terry Barber, who is a, a he's a director of makeup artistry for the brand based in the UK. Terry Barber on beauty is his Instagram. If you don't follow him to me, there is. And another person who was sort of, I, I, I think this is a really fun quote, last picked at kickball, first picked at Mac. And if you think about Mac from the 90s, that's kind of what was happening there. You know, <laughs> so it was funny. like, <laughs> I had a hard time, you know, I was sort of like the kid that ate on, the, on the, the radiator at school, you know, that nobody really understood. And then I came to this brand where there was like a million of us. <laughs> it was yeah, like we were partying in the streets. And so Terry is just one of those like counterculture, subculture guys who has taken the opportunity from working with a brand and made it, exploded it into an incredible career for himself because he's got such a passion for beauty and for makeup and the way that he talks about trends and past references and music. And I mean, he's just, and he's one of my dearest friends. And so to have that is, that to me is just beyond special. Mm -hmm. Um, As far as like professional makeup artists and other people that I feel like have really influenced me, I would say Val Garland is probably one of the, the top. Um, you know, I, I just love how she takes things to the edge and yet it's still beautiful, you know, cause there is a fine line when you're conceptualizing, especially, uh, between it looking like super interesting and cool and then teetering into like a craft fair, you know, or, yes. <laughs> so, you know, th- there is a fine line there and it takes a, it can take a long time to develop your eye. Um, but I remember this and I'm going to share this about Terry actually is when I, when I went from being a trainer standing in front of a room full of artists who wanted to know about Mac product to suddenly working backstage with Inga Glonard, right. Who's another amazing conceptual beauty makeup artist. Um, 
I didn't understand. There was a lot of hierarchy. There was a lot of stuff going on backstage that I just didn't know about. I'd never experienced it. And I was, I, I felt like every time they redid my foundation, you know, I couldn't get the skin and skin is one of the most important things you have to learn as a makeup artist. And I remember saying to Terry, because I, he had, I just met him, but I was already in awe of him. And I was like, can you, am I doing something wrong? Like, can you tell me like what I'm not getting? And he said to me, he's like, you know, he's like, I think you just have to look at it as like how light reads on the skin. That's what you need to recreate with your foundation. And mm -hmm. I was like, and I'm like nodding, like, uh huh, yeah, oh, 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 right. No idea what the hell he was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Until a few years later, as I started to like perfect my skill and to really hone it and to understand and stop, you know, getting my foundation taken off and redone. And, you know, you have those moments where you're like, oh God, they liked it. I'm just going to run away before they see something they don't like. Um, but I think for me, that was something that, that resonated with me that I will never forget. And I tell new makeup artists this all the time. You have to understand how light reads on the skin. Arbitrary highlighting, arbitrary contouring, not really understanding face shapes or the bones under the canvas will only hold you back as an artist. You really have to not be an autopilot. You really have to look at what you're doing and you really have to be in the present moment and examine the features of the person that you are working on. And so that was something I'll never forget. Like that is just one of those moments. Um, I mean, even if I look at somebody, I, I love to work with Tom Pichot because he understands the big picture of artistry, right? Like when you're working backstage, you don't always have to sweat the small stuff. You know, you got to look at the bigger picture and also the way he massages the skin and the way that he handles himself in front of models and the way that they all flock to him. I mean, there's just something like, oh, so wow about that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I love, uh, and I've had the chance to work with Ismaia French a lot uh, over the past few years. Um, and again, like, does, do I love every single solitary thing she does? No, but her process is so fascinating because she doesn't have, one of the things I love about people who never work for a brand is that they don't have any parameters. They just kind of go for it. And there's yeah. something so liberating about that. There's something so exciting to watch. It's like, okay, wow, I wouldn't have thought to just do that because I'm so like, there's so many rules, you know? Yeah, and I was going to say, you're not within the confines of the brand. Right. And so one of the things that I try really hard to instill in artists, especially when they have an opportunity or try to give them an opportunity to conceptualize, is to look at your art, look at your makeup as an art box. Look at it as color and texture, not as eyeshadow, lipstick, and blush. Really look at it as terms of what story you are trying to tell with this makeup and how do you get there, mm -hmm. you know, and what is the process and, and, and how do you define texture and what is the language of beauty? Because I think that there are so many things that happen when I see an artist that leaves Mac and they just suddenly explode and you're like, what happened? Because it's important. What is that quote? Is it Picasso that has this quote where you have to, to know the rules before you can break them? Yes. So understanding that element of like truly knowing how to do a technical cut crease, contoured face, sculpted eye, a perfect red lip. You got to know how to do all that stuff, right? You have to have yeah. good line quality and good symmetry. And, but you have to understand all that as a baseline, which is another thing I loved about working for Mac in the 90s because it was all about that structured technical makeup. And then once you get that mastered, then you can do whatever the heck you want because the makeup police are not coming. I'm yeah, telling you. <laughs> so true. So There's true. There's no sirens coming. I, I promise you. So tell me what you think the future holds for you. For me? Yeah. Well, I mean, I would say if this past year has had any uh, <laughs> any sort of nuances or nods to the future, it would be that content creation is, is certainly uh, paramount. Uh, understanding how to create things that are interesting to let your personality come out a little bit without offending people without being a jerk or you know uh, but I, I'm, a, I'm a woman of a certain age and you know what I'm, I'm not I'm not apologizing for that um, I own it you know and I think so for my job I think we're really looking towards building a community of creators being able to still talk about not the foundation of what Mac is, but how it excels into the future, how it explodes into the future and how that nebulous sort of what is Mac, who is Mac, you know, what happens there, 
how that energy, because it is, it's so magical when I think about, and I'm sorry, I don't want to not answer your questions. I'm going to go back a little bit to go forward. And that is that Mac has been really maverick in so many ways. The things that we have done as a brand, whether it's with RuPaul uh, in 1994 as, as the first Mac girl, you know, or with Katie Lang or having Rosalia as our Viva Glam spokesperson. Like there's just so many things that we have done that have been so like out there. And that's, we've changed the beauty industry. Um, and, and maybe now, you know, the, the, the view has slanted a little bit or shifted, but I want to continue telling that story. And I think that, you know, for us and for myself, finding unique ways to do that and, and revamp my storytelling is kind of where I'm, where I'm looking to go. Yeah. And really spreading roots and not being an anchor. I love that. I love that. So, and the future will be with Mac, maybe, maybe not. I mean, you know, at this point, I certainly have a lot of ideas about other things because I think when I leave, I, I could, if I had wanted to be a freelance makeup artist and really get out there and hustle and get with an agency, I would have had to have done that probably 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, because my hustle was different then. You know, my sure. energy was different. And I was married for 12 years. So at that time, you know, during the kind of time where I would have been maybe building my career in that way, I wanted to, the, any time I had left over after working, I wanted to spend it with my husband. And so it wasn't the right thing for me at that time. I have no regrets about any decisions that I've made. So I know that what I'm doing here is important for the people, the legacy that I want to leave behind for this brand. If I move past this, I, I don't know what, what I will do. I don't, I, I'm a very creative person. I'm a very colorful person. I love to paint. I love art. I love abstract. Um, I love things that are deconstructed. And so I don't know. It's a really good question because right now I don't have any plans on leaving um, because I feel fulfilled in many ways here. And, yeah. and so, you know, I am. I, um, and at 25 years, it's like, <laughs> where am I going? Um, and not that I couldn't go anywhere. I could go anywhere I wanted. And that's the beautiful well, part. Well, you might miss all your friends and yeah. there's camaraderie there for sure. Yeah. Uh, and I don't want to, there's not security in anything anymore. So I, I don't want to rely on that. But what's so beautiful about it is that we are still here. I'm still here talking about it. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, I have to encourage our listeners to follow you. Your Instagram handle is Carrie Blair, K-E-R-I-B-L-A-I-R. -I -I um, you have amazing work. I, I went Thank on your you. website and, and I would, you know, visit our website as well, makeupbycarriebee.com. Uh, amazing stuff, like really such a developed artist. Thank and you. I say that because sometimes you're behind the brand and I don't always get to see, um, the artistry of the brand ambassador, right? Sometimes it's right. a lot of behind the scenes. I love that you made it a point to capture everything you've done. Um, in addition to working your full-time job with Mac. Yeah, um, so you. amazing. I, I encourage everybody follow her on Instagram. She's got great stuff. Uh, you, you said you have a behind the brush series. Awesome. Thank when you. you can learn more about um, artists and just, you know, this whole community. Um, I think what you provided today gave our listeners so much to go off of as far as developing their career. I can't thank you enough. And I'm so, so grateful you were with us today, despite all these celebrations. <laughs> well, the other celebration is I got to do this. This was really exciting for me. So thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I hope it was interesting for your listeners and, and somewhat inspiring. And you know, certainly if you have any questions, I try really hard to answer, you know, obviously appropriate questions. Uh, but if you want to DM me or send me a private message or an email, feel free to do that. I, I really try to answer everyone. And, you know, shout out to all my D-Town peeps, you know, yeah, like Detroit in the house. I am not, I, I, uh, I, I have a lot of love for Detroit and um, I, 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 I appreciated all of my, my visits there because it's such a unique place. And um, I really, really, Devon, I really appreciate this opportunity. So thank you so much. No, thank you, Carrie. We we just, we love the stories we hear. This by far is, you know, part of my top favorite. I'm so grateful. Oh, I know you. the listeners are so grateful. 
You gave so much content. If I was the listeners, I'd be like writing down every name you dropped and and researching every single name. But anyways, I will uh, be um, respectful of your time and we'll let you run. But we will definitely have a follow up and and can't wait to hear what this new year uh, is going to bring for you. I mean, I know it's going to be so different within the brand. So it'll be really fun to catch up and and see where you're at. Well, anytime. I would love to talk to you again. I got lots of information about lots of different topics. So uh, anytime you want to chat, just let me know. That's awesome. Thank you, Carrie. Have a great day. Thanks, and we will connect too. soon. All right. Stay glamorous, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.